If you've got a book today, we're on page 151. Stay prepared and ready. That's the title of the lesson. I'm not saying that to you. But um, this is the last lesson in the unit that we have been studying about. The return of the Lord and his, uh, what's going to happen and what we should expect and the things that we should expect. Now we're moving over into Matthew 25 here for these verses. And this is a continuation of Jesus speaking to the disciples on the Mount of Olives. <clears throat> and um, here we go. When this lesson, if we boil it down to anything, this is going to be a lesson about being ready. And be ready is the basic uh, point of this lesson here. So, if we look at these, these verses here, these, in this, this uh, chapter 25, and we think about, like, is this addressing the church? Does this address the church before the rapture? Does this address people after the rapture? Well, I think, yes, both. I think this is wisdom that will apply to both. And we can, we can take a lesson from this right here, but people that are left behind will need to understand this as well. So the main point is be ready for his return. We are waiting for his return when we meet him in the air. Now people that are, that are not ready then, if they live long enough, and if he does not tarry too long, are going to have to live through a hard time called the tribulation. And then they're going to have to be ready again for him to return in power and, and conquering. So just be ready. Get ready. And if Anybody who enters into any kind, any kind of uh, meeting with the Lord and unprepared, it's, uh, it's not going to go well. It's because we have an appointment with God. Everybody has that appointment. And the unfaithful, when he returns, he will cast you out. So the themes, be prepared, be faithful, be at work. So that when he comes to gather us together, he doesn't find us idle. He finds us working and ready. And so we can apply this biblical truth to a lot of different situations. But, you know, wherever you are, whoever you are, we don't want to get un caught out unprepared. And that's what this is all about. So let's pray and we'll look at what uh, Jesus says about this. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for all your many blessings. We, we pray, Lord, today that you'll be with us and have your Holy Spirit work among us. Give me the words to say that your people need to hear. And we pray that the great teacher, the Holy Spirit, will just lead and guide us today. Be with us throughout the service and lift us all up and give us everything that we need, that spiritual sustenance, that we may light the lamps and, and let that light shine. Set it upon a hill so that all can see. We ask all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Okay, let's look at the first part. It's going to be Matthew 25 and just verses 1 through 5 here. And Jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven and what it is going to be like. Specifically what its return is going to be like. So, Matthew 25, verses 1 through 5. Jesus says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. 
So Jesus is referring to this uh, wedding traditions in Israel at the time. And if you look at the uh, lesson, it's on page uh, 52. Sorry, 152 there. About the second paragraph there. It says, the cultural background of this parable concerns Jewish wedding customs of the first century. Before a couple was married, they went through a period of betrothal. They were not fully married yet, but they were viewed as husband and wife. After about a year of a couple's binding betrothal, the groom, the groom went to the bride's home to bring her to his home for a seven-day feast. The groom did not do this alone. He was accompanied by a wedding party that escorted the couple to the bridegroom's home. In Jesus' parable, the wedding party included ten virgins. The virgins are young women of marriageable age. And here the word virgin is used not so much to highlight their virginity or lack of sexual experience, but to highlight their relationship to the bride. These were the bridesmaids. And it was a great honor, not only to be invited to the wedding, but also to be part of the wedding party. So we see this tradition here is that there's a wedding party. And the bridesmaids are waiting on the bridegroom to arrive to receive his bride. And you'll notice here, the actual bride does not show up in this parable. It's just the groom and the bridesmaids that are, that are talked about in this. Now, uh, my, the way that I interpret this, and you may, you may see it differently, is that these bridesmaids in this case then are the church, the whole church. And a church that is throughout the whole earth. We know that it would be the whole church because God has a special uh, use for the number 10, it seems like, in the Bible. He uses 10 for completeness. So we have 10 commandments. And in Jewish tradition, you needed, about, you needed 10 men to, for an assembly in the temple. And 10 virgins is the whole of the church. And the bridegroom, of course, is going to be Jesus. And it says in uh, verse 1 there, the ten virgins took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. So they are going forth to meet him. This is Jesus' return. When he comes in the clouds to receive us, we go forward to meet him. Just the same way they did. <coughs> now, everybody has an appointment with God and Jesus. Everybody is going to go forth to meet him one way or another. So this is wisdom for everybody. And Romans 14, 11 says, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So everybody will go and meet Jesus at some time, in some way. But not everybody is going at the same time, going in the same way, or going to be received the same way. And that's up to us how that happens. Now the five, the ten virgins have uh, lamps. And we're told that they have lamps. So lamps are uh, just torches, really. They're going to be poles, and there's a dish on the end of the pole, and you have a rag in that dish. And when you light the rag, you've poured some oil into your little dish there and then you can light that oil-soaked rag. And as the night goes on, if your oil burns down in the dish, you're gonna add a little more as the night goes on to make your lamp burn throughout the night. And these wedding processions, they could go throughout the night. So we have in this parable, the lamps that these, uh, these bridesmaids have. Now, of course, when you have one of these lamps and you run out of oil or you don't have any oil, there's no light. There's no light. It's a useless thing to have a torch that cannot be lit. So that light, that light is Jesus in this parable. That light is the light of the world. There's no other spiritual light that we can receive except him. And I want you to look at the rest of this metaphor. What's the oil? What is it that allows us access to the light, to Jesus? Well, that's the Holy Spirit of God. That Holy Spirit that is our guide 
He makes it possible for us to find the light. He draws us to the light of Jesus. Through conviction, he brings us to the confession of the cross. He points to the cross. That's the oil. And without that oil of the Spirit, there could be, we could have no way to the light. There'd be no light for us. And there are people who, if the Spirit does not call them when they want it to happen, they will reject that call. And they will go without the Spirit, but still try to seek some other way to the light. And what they find then is an imitation of the light. And this is a light that to them, or maybe even to other people, it might look real. But when tested, just like these lamps that have no oil, when tested, it doesn't light up at all. It's, it's false. It's fake. It's an idol. So and this is how all that works together. The darkened lamps are the lamps, are the, the lives, the spiritual lives, I think, of those who profess to believe, and they do not. They are people make believers instead of believers. If you look in verse 2 there, we have a division of the bridesmaids. Five are wise and five are foolish. So up until now, we haven't seen any difference in them. They are all identical outwardly. So if we think about these bridesmaids as the church, the whole church, a body of all believers, but included in here will be also those who claim to believe. And 2 Timothy 3 and 5 tells us what this, what this is. This is having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And he says, from such turn away. So in, within these bridesmaids, within this physical church, you can have people who are not part of the spiritual church. People who profess to believe don't really believe and um, are attempting to fool God and maybe even a lot of other people, sometimes themselves. And this parable regards the difference between a faithful believer and a false confessor. So what is the five wise virgins? To be faithful to God, to believe and confess. That is wise. To be unfaithful and to claim Jesus without believing in him and his redeem, redeeming power for real, that's foolish. And the false believer, like the foolish bridesmaids, can look exactly like a real believer if you're not careful to discern. They will go through the motions and they will be very, very committed. They are committed to religion. They will embrace Jesus Christ socially, politically, intellectually, even emotionally. But they will not come to repentance for real. That is a lamp without oil. It's useless and vain. And we saw back when we did a study of the Ten Commandments how the Jesus or God gave us the Ten Commandments. And one of the commandments in Exodus 27, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. And vanity means useless, selfish, and worthless use. So those who take the name of the Lord, and one of his names is Jesus Christ, and you do things with it that are useless or selfish, or do things, do nothing with it, that is taking his name in vain. And you might fool a lot of people, but you will not fool God. You can fool yourself That's when you right. have not fooled God. And a believer has to be drawn to the light of the Lord by the Spirit, by that oil that's in the lamp. So you must understand there is a separation between you and God that sin has caused. That is the conviction of the Spirit. That's where we have to start. And you have to understand that only the blood of Jesus can dissolve that separation between you and God and join you to him. And going to church will not join you to him. Being a good person will not join you to him. Giving money to charity, giving tithes will not join you to him. Studying the Bible alone will not join you to him. Doing a ritual 
or saying words will not join you to him. If you believe but do not confess, that will not join you to him. And if you confess and do not believe, that will not join you to him. So there are going to be many, both within the church, and there will be churches themselves, entire churches, that fall into this category of looking like they are believers, but it's, it's false. Right? And um, I don't say this to accuse anybody, but this is something that is very serious that needs to be looked at very closely. And if, if you're here today and you are not sure, become sure. Because the Spirit of God will make you sure. Yeah. And I'm not talking about times when your faith is weak. When your, your faith becomes weak, you can pray to God and say, give me more faith. That's one of the great things about our God is that the, the, the thing that He wants most from us is for us to be faithful. And we can ask Him for more faith. He will give you the thing that he wants most from you. Did you ever, did you ever have a time when your parents wanted you to like buy them a Christmas present or something? And you were a little kid. I don't have any money. I've got like a pocket with like some red clay in it. But they'll give you money to buy your parents some gifts. That's what our God does. He gives you faith if you ask. Because what God wants is the ask. Faith is in the asking and the expecting. And he will give you enough faith. But we're ta not talking about a, if your faith becomes uh, weak. What we're talking about is that there's no faith in you at all. And you say that there is. That's false. That's not true. And our God is a God of truth. Look in 1 Timothy 4 and 1. It says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And in Acts 20 and verse 30, he says, Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. So there is a, there is a, uh, a campaign by the devil to draw you, draw the lost, to uh, places where you can pretend to worship, but not really worship. Right. Paul calls these apostate. John says they are antichrists, not the antichrist, but against Christ. He says in John 2 and 18, he says, Little children, it is the last time, as you have heard, that the antichrist shall come. Even now there are many antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us. But they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. It's referring to people in the church. And these are false believers that appear faithful but are not faithful. And when they are tested, their faith goes out, just like one of these lamps that doesn't have any oil. It doesn't even light up in the first place for these, uh, these bridesmaids. And John even almost, he calls it um, providence. He says it's made manifest that they were not of us when you see these kind of things happening. You can, you can understand and see the false believer in this kind of thing, in these, in these faithless places, in these faithless practices. And Jesus told us what he's going to do about it. In Revelation, he talked to the, the faithful at the church of Philadelphia. He said in Revelation 3.10, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. He will keep you from the trial and tribulation. And to the unfaithful at Tyathera, in 22, Revelation 2.21, he says, And I give her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. And in 23... And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. So it will be judgment for the others. So Romans 8.14 finally says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So that's how we can know the leading of the Spirit identifies the true believer. The lack of that is what identifies the faithless confessor. 
So notice when Jesus is giving these judgments at the churches, he says, I know thy works. And he uses works to measure faithfulness. But not salvation. Works cannot measure salvation because it doesn't come from works. But good works are signposts of faithfulness. And uh, th there's a story that um, signifies this, I think, and, and it demonstrates this, that there was an early Christian about the year 400. His name was Martin of Tours, and he was a Roman citizen. His father was, he was born in Hungary, but his father was, a, I think he was a tribune in the Roman army, so a really high-ranking officer in the Roman army. And uh, they got assigned to go to northern Italy, and his father was going to serve in the army there and be a commander there. Now, northern Italy at this time, well, most of the Romans still uh, were not converted. Most of Rome still worshipped uh, the old gods. And the military, you were expected to worship this god Mithras that was still popular throughout Rome. And if you were in the military, that was supposed to be your god. And if you deviate from that, from the worship of this idol Mithras, uh, it get, you had a lot of problems. So Martin's father and his family, they were worshippers of this Mithras. But in northern Italy, there happened to be a lot of churches at that time. So when Martin was growing up, he heard the gospel, and he became a Christian. Now because he was the son of a tribune, he still had to join the army. That was forced upon you at those days. So he took a lot of, uh, he took a lot of flack for being a Christian and a soldier at the same time in the Roman army. But the spirit still got to him, and he had a friend, uh, a man named Severus, who was a Christian historian, and that's how we know about Martin's story, because he wrote about him. But Severus gives us a record of a confession that he heard from Martin one time. After Martin joined the army, he was stationed in Gaul, which was France when it was under Roman rule. And this is the southeastern part of France, up near the Alps, where it's going to be, it's very cold in that area. He came upon a shivering beggar in the cold. And Martin didn't have any money to give him, didn't have any food. He was completely dependent on, you know, the, uh, the quartermasters of the army to give him all of that stuff. The one thing that Martin had was a cloak. This was a cloak that he'd been given as a, as a standard issue to keep him warm while on campaign with the army. So what Martin did, and he's famous for this now, is he cut his, cut his cloak in half, saved just enough for him to have a cloak to keep himself warm, gave the other half to the beggar so that he could survive in the cold. He was uh, moved with compassion when none of the other soldiers who worshipped Mithras were. Uh, he was moved by the Spirit of God, is what happened. And Martin told uh, Severus, the historian, that later that night he had a dream, and he dreamed of Jesus. And he dreamed that he saw Jesus, and Jesus was in glory, and Jesus was surrounded by glory and he said Jesus was surrounded by many angels and they were also radiating this glory and this light and he said it was the most beautiful thing he ever saw but he also said there was one thing that was very much out of place in all of this he said Jesus was wearing half of an old army cloak and he said that reminded him of what he had heard from the missionaries it's in Matthew 25 and 35. For I was hungry and you gave me meat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. Naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. So that is the works that come out of the Spirit, the moving of the Spirit. And that's how, that's why we say, by the works you will know them. So, Let's go ahead and look at verse 3 here. It says, They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. So the foolish bridemaids, they have lamps, but no fuel to light the lamp. People who claim to believe on the Lord, but have not committed to Him and have not the Spirit to make them ready. So the wise bridemaids, they have lamps and fuel. These are true believers. They have the Spirit of God, and we are prepared to meet God, eagerly awaiting Him, loving His appearing, 
because of that. In the parable, the groom does not come to the feast quickly. We see in verse 5 there, the bridegroom tarries, so they all go to sleep. And it's the wise and the foolish that go to sleep. And the wise, they have good reason to go to sleep. They are prepared, and they sleep well. The foolish go to sleep too. But that's a foolish thing, because they are not prepared. So why do they go to sleep? Are they waiting for the last minute to become prepared? Have they fooled themselves to thinking they are prepared? Do they think the bridegroom is going to delay even longer and they'll have a little more time to be prepared? Could be any of those things. We notice all three of those things is the same excuse an unbeliever will give for remaining in unbelief. Waiting till the last minute. Fooling themselves into believing they're prepared. Or believing that Jesus will delay long enough some other time. I'll have time. All of these excuses. Let's look at the rest of uh, 6 through 9 in the book here, uh, in, the, in the scriptures, uh, Matthew 25, 6 through 9. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. So we have, very interestingly, the arrival of the groom, the return of Jesus, is uh, here reflected as it is told to us in 1 Thessalonians 4.16, which says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds. To meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. So just as in 25 and 6 of Matthew, there is a cry. And the bridegroom comes, and they go out to meet him. But for some, it's going to be a bitter day. There is no oil in the lamps. So what happens? Well, when all the bride maids are awakened by the shout, they trim their lamps. The trim just means that they prepare their lamps. The the Greek word is cosmeo, to prepare, and we get the cosmetics from that same Greek word, so that's how you prepare yourselves. Sometimes it's the cosmetics, so cosmeo, they prepare the lamps, they trim the lamps, and they're preparing the rag that goes into the dish. So they prepare the lamp, but when it's time to light the lamp, they don't have any way to light it up. When the time comes and their faith is tested, they find they don't have any at all. When it's time to make their faith work, they don't have any faith at all. They look like they had a lamp that would work. They didn't have it at all. So it's a faithless confessor. They are spiritual, but not religious. They are, their true nature is revealed by what is missing. So naturally, they try to borrow oil from the wise bridesmaids. But that can't happen. You can't borrow that. They used to say... Um, on airlines, I don't know if they still say it, but they would say, secure your own mask. Did everybody hear, hear them say that on a plane? What it meant was you don't make two problems out of one. What you gotta do is, if you, if they, you know, when they're uh, in a plane and there's a problem, these oxygen masks used to drop down out the bulkhead and you have to put those on in case something happens with the air pressure. But they, they would say like, look, if you see the person in your seat and they having trouble getting their mask on, don't move, go try to help them, and now you can't breathe. Put your mask on, <laughs> and then help them put their mask on. But if you don't put your mask on, and you're fum- both fumbling with theirs, then you're, you're both not being able to breathe. So don't, you cannot lead someone to salvation unless, well, first, you've come to salvation, and you know what it is. But also, you've studied the Bible, and you know how to answer any objections to the leading of the Spirit. It, and if you've read, you've understood, and that you've been faithful. So that when we pray to God, before we witness to somebody, that we know that he will listen and that he will answer. So secure your own mask. 
Use your own oil. And the wise maids, they, they represent the, the true believer because the oil, of course, the Holy Spirit, and the presence of the Spirit, that's salvation. And if an unbeliever or a false believer, they try to borrow salvation, that's impossible. And the Bible is clear on this. I know Brother Billy's spoken a lot on this. Nobody can give you salvation except Jesus. That's a gift between you and God by the Spirit through Jesus. And at the last day, you know that there are going to be a lot of people who try to borrow salvation. Hey, my wife got saved. All my kids were saved. I went to a church that we got a lot of people saved. I did a lot of great things. I was a good person. Have I not prophesied in thy name and in thy name cast out many devils and done wondrous works? But that's not enough. And we can't give salvation as much as we want to. We probably all know somebody that we would love to bring them salvation on our own and just, you know, drag them in. We can't do that. We can only lead them as far as we can. It's up to them to accept it. And friends, family, even children, the best we could do is to guide them to the gospel, use the gospel to bring them to an understanding and to, and to conviction. And so the wise bridemaid said to the foolish, we can't give you any oil. But no, they didn't stop there. They said, here's where you can go to get it. <laughs> so they told them where you can go to get the oil. That's what we're supposed to do. Like these wise bridemaids, show them, tell them where to get the oil that they need, where to get the Spirit of God. And how do we know they were too late? Well, look in the, the, the last uh, the verses here. This is 10 through 13. He says, And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. So how do we know they were too late? It's in verse 10. While they are preparing, that's when the groom arrives. They should have prepared already. Been prepared. Been ready. Not been getting ready. Because then it's too late. And when he returns in glory for everybody to see, you're going to be rushing to try to undo all the faithlessness that they had. It's too late to prepare them. And when the door is shut, when God shuts the door, it shuts tight. He shut the door of the ark. He shut it tight. It was waterproof. It was also center proof. And Jesus has the keys. He is the door and he has the keys. And when he shuts the door, it does not open it. We see in Revelation 3, 7, he says it to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, right? These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. No person, no man, no devil, no being will ever open it again. But while it's open, the devil cannot shut it. Only thing he will do is try to convince you never to go through it. But there is no other way to open that door. The only way through is through the one who has the keys, and that's Jesus. Amen. And he's going to leave it open Amen. as long as the Father says to. And this is a reminder to all of humanity that there's going to be a last altar call. And I believe there's a soul already ordained by God that's going to be the last one to get saved. And he knows who it is. And after that... That'd be the last of the elect that has come forward. And that's when I think the Father's going to say, go. And I just think that because that's when the work of the church will be finished. And there's no need for the church to remain after that. And we don't know who that's going to be, of course. We don't know when that will happen. But, you know, it'll be in a church that has the spirit of God there that happens. That might be in this church that that happens. It could happen here, you know? That's interesting to think about. It could be here. So if you're here right now and you are not saved, if you're not right with God, you could be the last one. 
You're holding the train up for the rest of us. If we'd like to go, so come on up. But that's okay. <laughs> I know uh, Brother uh, R.B. sings that song, Wait a Little Longer. And uh, that's a good sentiment. As, as much as we want to go, every day that, that God waits, every day that the bridegroom tarries, it's, uh, it's a blessing, it's a mercy for the unredeemed and even the false believer to come back around, get it done. So the foolish maids that come when the door is shut, they call on the groom, but they are rejected. It's too late. And it's a repetition of Matthew seven twenty one, where Jesus specifically rejects false confessors. And I'll read Matthew seven twenty one. He says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now look at 25, 11, and 12. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Almost exactly the same. This is what Jesus is trying to get across in this parable. These foolish virgins, they were not prepared. So when the time came, just like the false believer, they came and they knocked and they said, Let me in! But it was closed. And it will not open again. So Jesus is urging everybody, be watchful, be prepared. And he says, you don't know the day. But you notice in verse 13, he says, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Right? And that baffled me at first. I thought, why does he say, if we don't know the day, of course we won't know the hour. But you know, I think Jesus, he understands what people are like. I think he knows that if we knew the day, but didn't know the hour, we would still falter. We would still get distracted by a TV show, some family drama, a fight we had on Facebook. If we knew the day but not the hour, we would still probably get mixed up in something else. He knows how people are, how easily we fall into those traps. But you can apply this parable to a lot of situations. It signifies the return of Jesus. At the end of time, he will separate the faithful from those who sided with the beast. Especially the false Christs, the false teachers, the false prophets. And he will use this time for those who were not taken with the rapture to tribulate the world. And a tribulate just is a verb that comes from an old uh, farming device they used to have. It was an old Greek farming device. All it was was a big board with nails all in it. And they would have their ox... They would lay out their grain, have the ox drag this big board across the, the grain, and the nails would slice the grain and cut the husk away so that you could get to the grain inside there, cut the shell away. And that's how they, they threshed the grain and got all the grain out of there. But Jesus, when, when the Bible talks about tribulation, you can see what we're talking about here. Tribulation, can you imagine the spiritual equivalent of having that farming device full of nails dragged over you. The horrible suffering that will go on at this time. But that suffering will separate the shell from the grain. What's, what's useful from what's not useful. So we see there's wisdom for us even now because there's apostasy in the church still. And we have a double duty. We've got to minister to unbelievers. But we've got to challenge everybody, ourselves, others, be ready to be prepared. Even if you are sure that you have the Spirit and you are, uh, you are uh, saved by Christ and you understand and you know that you are saved, you still got to be ready. Because Jesus will judge by our works. And Paul says that to us. Paul tells us how that uh, Jesus is going to judge us according to works. We're going to be judged according to our works still. Not saved according to our works, but still judged. And Paul says you can be saved and still not hear from him 
well done, good and faithful servant. And th Paul calls it, you will get into heaven, you will escape like you went through a fire, barely escaped through a fire. And you'll enter into heaven and your eyebrows are burned off and your hair is all singed, walking around in heaven like that because you barely made it through. And Jesus says, don't do that. Paul says, don't do that. Be always ready and be always working. And even though, you know, we, a day is as a thousand for the Lord, it's a thousand years to the Lord, you know. So he's, he's only waited a couple of days. So what? But to a righteous supreme being that God is, I can't even imagine what the, the stench of sin in the world rising up on him has uh, he filled up the vials of wrath and they're still filling up. But for those who he does not want to go into the pit, he's still waiting and still enduring this sinful world and still holding back his wrath like a great tidal wave. He's holding it back. He's holding it back for somebody. So don't mock it if that's you. He's to be praised for that forbearance. So don't take that as permission. Don't play games with this. And be sure and be ready. Let's pray and we'll end it there. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for this church. We thank you for your loving grace. We thank you for your merciful forbearance. We, we pray, Father, that you will bless this day. Bless those that are with us. And for those that couldn't be with us, Father, we ask that you will just give them understanding, give them faith, or give them healing, Father, so that they can come and worship with us and and to uh, just to praise you as we do. And Father, we pray that you'll be with us through the rest of the service. Let the Holy Spirit guide us. Be with Brother Bill as he brings us a message. Let it be the message that we need to hear to pierce us and to stay with us and something that we can take with us, Father, just to nourish us as we go out into the world and to minister to others, both the believing and to the lost. And Father, we ask that you will just bless uh, everything that we do here today and let it all be just for thy glory. In Christ's name we ask, amen.